Hi, everyone. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. Thank you so much for joining. My name is Tara Virchelis. I work for the World Resources Institute as an urban development associate within the Ross Center for Sustainable Cities. This is the fifth webinar of the GPSC Resource Team webinar series, which explores sustainable and integrated urban development through diverse topics. We've designed this webinar series to tackle the sometimes daunting concept of integrated planning by exploring how it applies to different sectoral topics and technical solutions and understanding how these actions can lead to sustainable and low carbon cities uh, by highlighting the relevant sectors, actors, regulations, or financial aspects of these solutions, we hope to impart actionable information that can help support decisions and implementation efforts that make cities more sustainable and integrated. And before I continue, I'd like to acknowledge that this webinar series is made possible through generous funding from the Global Environment Facility. WRI, C40, and ICLE together make up the resource team and are working in partnership with the World Bank in support of their global platform for sustainable cities. And this platform brings together participating cities and a wide range of entities that are working on urban sustainability issues to create a shared platform for global knowledge and an evidence-based integrated approach to realize very worthwhile outcomes. So today we're going to hear about transforming streets and public spaces with tactical urbanism. Road safety is a global concern. Each year more than 1.35 million people are killed on roads with tens of millions more injured or disabled. Traffic accidents are the number one cause of death for people aged five to 29. And many of those people are pedestrians, cyclists and motorcyclists. As part of its road safety program, WRI has developed tactical urbanism interventions that seek to influence the public policy of cities to generate permanent solutions that improve the safety conditions for residents. This webinar will present three cases, one in India and two in Brazil, in which tactical urbanism interventions have been used as a tool to catalyze improvements in public space and road safety. So the presentation is structured around these themes. We'll hear an overview of what is tactical urbanism and what are some of the principles. And then we'll hear a case study from India and two from Brazil. And each of the cases will detail the design recommendations, stakeholders and engagement efforts, challenges, faced, and impact. Today we have two presenters. First, we'll hear from Rohit Tak, Rohit is a senior project associate with WRI's road safety program under the Bloomberg Initiative for Global Road Safety, where he is involved in the streets and intersection design projects in Mumbai, Bangkok, and Ho Chi Minh City to make them walkable, bikeable, and thus safer by design. <clears throat> Rohit is working in the field of urban planning and design. His work focuses on providing technical support, advocating community engagement in the planning processes, and building capacity of city officials. He holds a bachelor's degree in architecture from the University of Pune and a master's degree in urban design from the University of California at Berkeley. And then we'll hear from Bruno Rizon. Bruno is a road safety analyst at WRI Brazil. He is a member of WRI's road safety program under the Bloomberg Initiative for Global Road Safety, where he provides technical support and coordination with program partners and city stakeholders in urban mobility projects from Brazilian and international developing cities. Bruno is skilled in producing technical and management reports and guidelines, technical notes and materials to raise awareness of safety. He's experienced with road safety audits and inspections. Bruno holds a bachelor's degree from Universidade Federal do Rio Grande do Sul in civil engineering, with a focus on transportation. Part of his graduate work was held at Politecnico di Torino in Italy. Thank you both for joining us. So each speaker, oops, each speaker will speak for about 25 to 30 minutes. We'll hold time at the end for questions and answers. If you do have questions for specific presenters, um, you can type them into the box and please make sure to address them if they are for one or the other. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to Rohit.
Great. Um, I'm just trying to share my presentation. Okay, well, hello, everyone. I'm Rohit. Um, thank you, Tara, for the generous introduction. With me, I'm also having um, Saurabh Jain, who is a consultant working with WRI, and he's instrumental for getting this project, which I'm explaining, implemented on site. So he'll help us understand if there are any questions related to the implementation. So my presentation uh, first will uh, touch upon uh, a brief introduction of the ideas of tactical urbanism. Um, then briefly, I'll talk about Indian cities and road safety, then uh, how tactical urbanism is used to introduce uh, road safety in the case of uh, the city of Mumbai in India, um, the process of measuring and data collection, and how we um, achieved uh, from temporary to permanent uh, implementation using the process of tactical urbanism. Usually, um, imagining any kind of transformative, transformative change is um, easy for designers. They came up with ideas like seen in this image, mid-block crossings, refuge areas, bike stands, street furniture, uh, shrinking um, the road diet and um, allowing a lot of public space. Uh, but it's always not easy um, to to transform these ideas in reality. The support to bring the transformative change in public projects like this is challenging, mainly because the conventional planning process is first time consuming. Um, the bureau bureaucratic processes take a lot of time. Um, it's expensive. It need, takes a lot of money to transform uh, public spaces or streets. Um, uh, it needs a series of approvals prior to the actual implementation of the project. And it's always um, the case that the politician who is sitting in the office during that time, the project doesn't get completed. And the new politician who is coming on board is not uh, always following the same agenda. So that also delays the process. And this, uh, everything results into lack of trust between the stakeholders and the city authorities. Um, Jane Jacobs in her uh, book has planning lacks tactics for building cities that work like cities. What she meant by this is that um, city uh, planning, when practiced as a top-down approach, it doesn't really solve the contextual needs, the con contextual problems. So bottom-up approaches are required to solve any kind of problems. Mike Lydon, the, the, the author of the book, um, Tactical Urbanism, action for long-term change has further uh, explained this by saying that city can't address its challenges merely through planning for long-term, but through many small-term projects involving smaller tactics, making long-term projects possible. So what is tactical urbanism? So tactical urbanism is a, a city organizational or citizen-led approach to neighborhood building and project delivery using short-term, low-cost, and scalable projects intended to catalyze long-term change. Tactical urbanism is also referred as planning by doing, um, urban acupuncture, guerrilla urbanism, pop-up urbanism, do-it-yourself urbanism, or bottom-up urbanism mainly concentrates um, on the right of way uh, spaces serving multiple purposes. <clears throat> so the approach of tactical urbanism is not new. Uh, this is the example of um, the city of Paris, um, where the repurposing uh, of underutilized spaces along the riverfront, um, the same riverfront was uh, done in 18th century. And the, uh, the riverfront was converted into a pop of bookstore which got converted into this. This is how it looks today. The riverfronts are permanent, uh, the bookstores are permanent along the riverfront. They also add to the economical vitality of the riverfront and also creates a stronger sense of belonging. The second example I would like to give is the uh, park clips in San Francisco. Um, in 2005, a rebar, um, a design firm, had started to attempt uh, to reclaim the street spaces set aside for private cars and convert them into public spaces which later became like a parking day movement, which is once a year, uh, residents in San Francisco rent out the uh, parking spots and convert them into public spaces. This further laid towards um, around 60 permanent, permanent parklets in the city of San Francisco. And the city also started a program called Pavement to Parks and uh, has approved um, all these 60 permanent parklets and come, came up with a manual called San Francisco Parklet Manual for people who would like to rent out spaces and convert them into permanent par parklets. 
Third example is um, from India, Rahagiri Day. Rahagiri Day is India's um, version of open streets. It started as a movement where twice in a month, the urban streets are reclaimed by people. Um, it started in the city of Gurgaon and um, uh, it has been selling, uh, scaling up in um, different Indian cities. This movement gathered a lot of stakeholder as well as media attention and further led to, uh, for people to understand the importance of streets as open spaces for all users and not just for, uh, for cars. Reclaiming street spaces for the active transport in cities like Bhopal in India is one of the long-term gain of the tactical attempts like Rahagiri Day. So this is the example in the city of Bhopal where um, the street uh, space is um, allocated for active transport and it's a uh, result of the Rahagiri Day. And so why tactical urbanism? Well, firstly, because um, it's an iterative uh, uh, process that you can act, try something out. If it doesn't work, you can rectify it and try that out and know what works and what doesn't. It allows designers, planners, and city authorities to alter the designs based on the user experience before its permanent uh, implementation on site. This is the classic image what you see on the screen um, where um, the ideal design uh, versus the user experience is um, prominently seen. The design outcome would have been completely different if the most obvious path seen in this image was first tried, tested, before um, this design was implemented. In addition, a th a tactical urbanism helps city authorities to test new designs by using cost-efficient ways. Um, it allows um, city authorities um, to expedite the sanctioning process. Um, it also al allows them to work together with citizens, advocacy groups, various stakeholders, and thus strengthening their rela re relationships. Uh, tactical urbanism also uh, helps users to experience the change with lighter implementation. Seeing is believing. Once you see, feel, and um, chase, see, uh, experience the change, then it's easier for you also to get used to the actual implementation which is going to happen after that. Um, tactical urbanism also helps um, to enc encourage public engagement um, and understand what works and what doesn't. So how to use tactical urbanism? So first is to conceptualize on paper, uh, engage authorities, citizens, build it on site, then project it for a limited period of time, measure it, uh, collect the data, learn out of that data, and again go back to the design if some kind of rectification is required. Now this part of the presentation is the brief explanation of what uh, is the road safety scenario in Indian cities. So road safety in India is an alarming concern. The chart shows that around 45% of deaths by unnatural causes in India are a result of traffic fatalities. So there are around 388 traffic fatalities in India every day, which is one fatality every 34 kilometer and one fatality every 1,001 127 vehicles on the road, which is actually like one jumbo jet crashing every day. In the case of Mumbai, the data suggests that around 51% of the total mode share is, um, it consists of pedestrians and cyclists. However, around 52% of total traffic fatalities involve pedestrians and cyclists. Pedestrian safety is a big concern in cities like Mumbai. This is how this typical street in Mumbai looks like, where everyday people are seen pushed out of the spaces meant for walking or cycling due to the sheer pressure of the increasing number of cars. And this is how the in intersection looks like. Similar to the streets, the intersections are not safer for pedestrians, they are large, and um, uh, situations like this where uh, different kind of commuters Across the street, um, the conflicts happen and crashes take place. So we tried to take the case of HP intersection in Mumbai and applied the principles of tactical urbanism to make it and transform it into a safer intersection. So the HP intersection is um, a part of Bandra neighborhood in Mumbai, where uh, five streets, one local street, uh, a commercial street, residential street, they all meet together and form a five-way intersection. This is how the existing configuration of the intersection is like. The area is large, which is 1,000 
265 square meters. And um, this is how the intersection looks like during a busy hour. Uh, it has very high vehicular and pedestrian volume. The intersection has traffic lights, but still requires two to three traffic police personals to manage the traffic. The intersection has almost no pedestrian infrastructure, making it unsafe for pedestrians to cross and see people clubbed together at the corner for vehicles to stop and cross the road. The conflicts between the pedestrians trying to cross the junction and vehicle, vehicular movement create chaos and incessant honking only adds on to the health hazards. This is other part of the same intersection where you can see the slip lane is being provided and it's been used by less than 1% of the vehicles throughout the day. Still that entire lane is uh, dedicated for vehicles. So while um, designing this intersection, the criteria we followed was first to introduce correct street geometry, aligning the lanes and ensuring smooth traffic flow. Uh, so that no conflicts between vehicles and different users and overtaking of vehicles um, happens at the intersection. Um, we also try to compact the intersection area, um, provision of adequate pedestrian refuge uh, at the medians and refuge islands was uh, one of the criteria and creation of public uh, pedestrian refuge um, and shorter cro crossing distances was other criteria. So, this was this is how as, as i showed you um the existing kind of configuration was and this is what we produced. we reduced the intersection area by nearly uh, 465 square meters how we achieved this by extending medians and introducing uh, pedestrian refuge areas at the medians uh, by reclaiming space from residual areas at the intersection to create refuge islands residual areas means the areas which are given for cars but where cars are not uh, commuting. So those are the extra areas at the intersection. So those we reclaim for public use and reclaiming the slip lane to create public space refuge. So this worked on paper. So now what? So after that, the process was to get the traffic police um, uh, on board because they are, they are the main stakeholders in the city of Mumbai um, to execute any kind of um, short term implementation. Um, involve local stakeholders, local businesses, local citizens, uh, citizen, citizen groups, arranging tools like chalks, paints, barricades, and deciding the date and um, conducting the trial. The trial was projected for 45 days, where during the, this period, um, the before after scenarios were measured um, and data was collected. Stakeholders involved in the process were uh, the city authorities, um, from the road and traffic department, um, the traffic police, um, then advocacy groups like WRI, uh, local stakeholder, um, politicians, uh, citizen groups, and local residents. So the planning was done by the city authorities and advocacy groups, and programming and activation was done by the local stakeholder. So, uh, in the in like eight hours in the night, we transformed this entire intersection into this with the help of chalks, paints, and barricades. So this is the space, the slip lane you see here. It's been reclaimed and um, converted into a public space. Barricades were used to um, to to, to um, lay out the new geometry of this uh, intersection design. And the next day, the citizens woke up to this new intersection, which had reclaimed public space, compact intersection area. The clearance time for the vehicles were, was shorter because the intersection was compact. Um, we also had um, pro provided pedestrian crossings, pedestrian refuges, and it was really good to see that people were actually using all these um, short-term Im uh, implementations. It had walkable sidewalks and it had public space for all age groups. So after this uh, implementation was done, uh, we had um, collaborated with Brisk Synergies as a, a consultancy firm in Canada, um, and they helped us understand the crash conflict analysis. Seen in this image is a screenshot of the snippet which they uh, provided us. This was the before scenario. 
um, before trial, how the crashes or near misses were happening on site, how risky the intersection was. And this was the after uh, or during trial scenario and how the uh, vehicle channelization um, got smoothened and traffic flow was smooth um, and how the number of crash occurrence got reduced. As per the data provided by them, um, with this implementation, we reduced the average vehicle speed at the intersection by 15%, which was um, a big achievement. We reduced the high risk conflicts per hour by 71%, medium risk conflicts by 68% uh, and low risk conflicts by 60%. So this data collection and analysis was helpful for the city authorities and for us to push this design into uh, a permanent implementation. So then we came back on uh, drawing board and the, uh, some rectification or iteration to the design happened. Um, we've reworked on some, some dimensions, some um, proposal which we already had like uh, that got re um, redone and um, construction on site started. The phase for one was um, redoing the turning areas and the sidewalks. Uh, and later the city started constructing the uh, refuge areas. And the so from pre-trial, like before scenario, before even the trial was done, we, with the help of tactical urbanism, we reached to this stage and after trying this out for 45 days and later uh, following the process of tendering the project, we reached to this stage, which is the recent photo, where all the, uh, all the design proposals which we had um, given, it all is um, implemented on site. So after HP intersection, um, because it was so successful, the city reached out to us to conduct similar trials at different intersections in Mumbai. So first is the image at Nakpara intersection. As you see, a huge space um, used for um, taxi cabs to park was reclaimed. And now this project is also being constructed. The permanent implementation is ongoing. And second is Alvarez intersection of which trial was done and it's pro is now in process of um, getting up, approved for final construction. Scaling up is another uh, important um, aspect of doing such um, projects um, tact using tactical urbanism. So after HP intersection success, um, WRI conducted total four trials in Mumbai, uh, out of which three are uh, undergoing um, permanent construction, and 34 intersections are uh, designed and submitted to city authorities for uh, permanent implementation. about uh, the case in Mumbai. Um, Bruno from Brazil office will help us understand the uh, cases from Brazil. And while Bruno is, is transitioning the presentation, um, Rohit, can you tell us a little bit about what will happen in the public space reclaimed during the trial? Is it gonna function in the same way as, pro as we had programmed? I'm sure. Saurabh, do you want to answer this? Yeah, sure. Uh, so the public space which is there will be, uh, so right now the way you see it, it's like a public plaza. The whole reason uh, behind reclaiming that space was because of uh, the amount of pedestrians which cross uh, from there during peak hours, the numbers are extremely high. Like it's literally 5,000 pedestrians within an hour during the peak hour. So, uh, and also like, uh, right now, if you will see all the traffic islands in the before image, Roy, can you go back to the, yeah. Okay. Uh, so in the before image, if you would have seen there were all the traffic islands were inaccessible, they were completely green. So people couldn't access them. So right now you need like a larger breathing space. And that's why that space is going to be left open as a public plaza, which can accommodate that number of pedestrians. I hope that answers the question. Yes, thank you. Okay. All right, Bruno, you're set to go. Thank you. Thank you, go ahead. Thank sure. you, it was a great presentation. Um, glad to join you. Hello, everyone. So, uh, oh, it's not working here, let me try. Okay. So, I want to start this presentation with a question that is, how is your city design? 
This is an important question because the way we design our cities and for whom we design it, we design it, we result in the city we want. So we can design our city in different, with different aspects and features that can prioritize different users and impact in how we use our spaces. In the left, we have an example of streets design with focus on the flow of vehicles. We can plan city for cars or for vehicles to develop higher speeds. Cities that are not usually results in cities with unsafe streets, right? So higher speeds are the main risk factor for deaths, deaths you know, on our streets. And usually people and pedestrians can use it safely and can enjoy it. But we can design our cities for people. We just need to develop a people-centered mindset. The cities will guarantee an identity for the city and its citizens will enjoy more the public spaces and we'll be able to walk around safely. We can design cities that are vibrant, like Avenida Paulista in Sao Paulo during Sundays, where, most, where the most famous and important avenue is closed for cars. And so every person can ride bicycles, can play games, you have children running around, chatting, and other stuff that creates an identity. New York started to design the city based on a Vision Zero concept where no deaths on the roads would be acceptable. Or a city like Copenhagen, where, which also had a congestion of vehicles on its streets, now you see congestion of bike riders. Belo Horizonte also in Brazil, developed several BRT corridors and pushed for a more sustainable way of transportation. So the city we design impacts on the way people experience the city. The infrastructure of our cities should be safe comfortable, accessible, and that can promote co coexistence and social belonging. We can see here some examples. In Seattle, in the USA, we, they completely changed a street that created and created space for people and slowed down vehicles. Also here in Medellin, a huge change in the space distribution happened, where once vehicle dominant, now we have a pedestrian space dominance and it's a more joyful place to walk and to be safe and for pedestrians to safely walk there. So today we have the government or the public power which is the one that creates the infrastructure and the society that uses this infrastructure. Uh, so today we have a transition in the reality. Both actors can and are demonstrating a will to act in a different way to improve our public spaces and streets. An active society demands for changes. The public power needs to align expectations and manage resources in a smarter way to better understand the new necessity that this society have. But both actors have different perspective on how it can be done and how they can act. So we need a paradigm break. And this is where the tactical urbanism enters. The tactile urbanism can provide this alignment and test ideas in a temporary manner. That if it doesn't work, it's okay, we can go back and we can realign expectations and try new ideas. So, the tactical urbanism is a strategy and an intervention in the public space that is fast, low cost, reversible, and open to dialogue with the population. Also, we can have different ways and actors involved. Uh, both in the uh, idealization and execution. We can have from a not, not institutionalized intervention where its idealization and execution starts with the community, passing from different forms where it can be done by part by community and part by the government until we have a full in institutionalized intervention. But don't mistake it with just by the government. The government can and must engage the community. So, uh, that said, after a brief context on some concepts on tactical urbanism, uh, and Rohit already talked about others, I will introduce you to two case studies that happened in Brazil and that WRI was glad to support it. And these two interventions are interesting to present because we will see that we can have different ways of executions and idealizations possibilities, which is the one I just presented. So, uh, the first one I will present is Cidade 2000, Cidade 2000. Uh, it's a neighborhood in Fortaleza. Uh, this is an uh, aerial photo from the 1,000 square meters 
that an intervention took place, it completely changed a, an area that was also used as a parking area and uh, had parking and uh, just traffic lanes into a high quality space for pedestrians to use during a trial period at first. So uh, to start, here's a brief history from Fortaleza and what might have helped to get the city into this point. In 2015, Fortaleza joined the Bloomberg Initiative uh, for, for Global Road Safety, which is an initiative that aims to reduce fatalities on our streets. And uh, well, in 2016, Fortaleza announced its first low speed zone and immediately saw positive results. Uh, later, they announced other two low speed zones, that is Albert Saving and Cidade 2000. Uh, but the, they decided to test first the design in Cidade 2000. And that is how the intervention based on the technical urbanism took place. Uh, so the area, the area from Cidade 2000 is a mixed land use area with many commercial and residential places. And in the evening, it's a dense public space with food trucks and street food. The area is composed by basically by three plazas. The first one, it's the biggest, and I also have a weekly street market that sells food, vegetables, and etc. Et the second one has lots of street foods, and people love sitting there to eat something at night. The third one was supposed to be used for playing and for kids, but the infrastructure is not that good. So here we is we can see an overview of the area. Uh, the plaza number one, it's where we had the intervention. And here is an aerial photo uh, from how it looked like before. Uh, here we can see how the, uh, uh, from Google Street View, a view from the, the plaza number one, this one, uh, with and without, without the street market. We can see how it changed and how it was, a lot of, it was composed by a lot of vehicles there, just parking and no people around. So why Cidade 2000 was chosen? First, it had a strong political interest due to the characteristic of the area and because residents were asking for the street market to be reallocated due to all the trash left uh, and the, the noise it made. Also, the city government already had a project for the area and they were interested in executing. And not just the state government, but other secretariats also had projects for the area. And at last, because the city hall was interested in launching, in launching a project called Cidade da Gente, or uh, that is something like City of People. Uh, this project wanted to create temporary interventions in specific areas with the objective to requalify and turn areas more livable for its community during a short period of time. So uh, the intervention uh, had all the factors aligned. That's why tactical urbanism was just, uh, would fit just perfect. <clears throat> so the objective was to recreate what would be the project, in each of the initial project by the state in two phases. The phase number one uh, would uh, take a livable place and the second, the second, the plaza one would be a return to, um, to a livable place. And the second phase was supposed to expand the area for pedestrians on the plaza number two, that is in front of plaza number one. So it's important to say that the city changed, that it is changed during the process due to the timeline and costs. Because it was really big areas involved and it was the first time the city was doing such an intervention and it would be too risky. So the city started their community engagement with public hearings to better understand the region, the residents, their demands, and later to talk about the project. The positive result, uh, was that the residents supported because to have the intervention going on the street market, the street market would have to be reallocated, right? So a popular demand was being heard and that's great. But the downside uh, was that doing the strong focus of, of population on reallocating the street market was really hard to pass by all the points that the intervention would have and how it would happen. Uh, so the project uh, had support from partners from the Bluebring Initiative, WRI and NACTO, and uh, we had several rounds of discussions on the design uh, until the partners and other involved were aligned on that. 
So the intervention had a focus to improve the space for pedestrians and should be temporary. The initial idea was supposed to be only for three days. Partners pushed for 15. Uh, and that was, is what was agreed. And depending from the evaluation and feedback, it could continue. Also to have a better reason, let's put it in this way, uh, the intervention was launched during the mobility week. Uh, about the materials, both partners supported with financial resources, uh, but the support from the secretariats were fundamental because they had existing contracts for paint and jar plants. Also, for other cultural and music activities, the cultural secretariat helped, helped to support it also. Uh, the university also played a big role and helped with a digital, digital totem so people could evaluate the intervention. Uh, the activities was uh, covered was health assistance. They helped to the population to, to do the legal documents, some uh, ID documentation or the public, public transport cards, and also was uh, uh, arranged a public bike ride that the mayor would be included. Uh, so now we have uh, this complete overview from the process. I will pass step by step by how the intervention took place and it started during the night. We had a, a, a strong support from the traffic agency uh, and they, they helped with these existing contracts for pub public painting and other secretariats helped for the, the public cleaning of the area. Uh, and also the agents was uh, blocking the traffic, was managing the traffic, so everyone could, uh, we could draw the, the, the new design on this area. Uh, so, the painting, uh, the, play, the paint area, the city, said they helped a lot, and they had these paint guns that they, that they helped to reduce the time of implementation drastically. Because if we just had volunteers who take a lot of longer time if we had just uh, paint brushes and stuff. And these, uh, uh, these paint guns, they, help, they also help to, to a, a better adherence on the, on the pavement. Uh, the plane jars were bigger than what everyone expected when they arrived. Uh, they were really heavy also, and so uh, a truck had to bring it and help it to unload it. But it was great to, to create a very comfortable space and with shadow spaces because the plants were really big. But we divided from a uh, smaller one and bigger ones. The bigger plants were used around the benches and around the square in general. And the short ones were, were used close to the pedestrian crossings so we could minimize uh, intervisibility issues between vehicles and, and pedestrians that were crossing. Uh, also a little, about the, the, a little about the urban furniture that were used. We had these sun umbrellas and also some plastic chairs for people to sit around. Uh, we also had these benches made with concrete blocks and wood, uh, which is great because they can be unmade pretty quickly. So it's really temporary, but they work it very well during the intervention. Also some joyful painting were joyful painting was, were created on the pavement so kids could enjoy it. As you can see on this photo, the people, the kids were having a really good time. They were uh, uh, playing around. It was really great to see that. Uh, also, this was the totem used for the evaluation and for being digital, it made it easier for people to answer questions and to go there. Was, we, had a, we needed less people to, to be doing this. So, uh, here you can see a photo of the preparation for, of the bike ride. A lot of people joined and it was nice because it started in other point of the city and came all the way down until, this, until Cidade de 2000, where the intervention was took place. So that was great to gather people on, on its way. And also the mayor showed up and uh, it had the entire press covering and it really helped it to scale up this project because people started to, care, to create a demand for more. So uh, here are some pictures from before and after. We can see how it completely changed the area. Uh, once where vehicles could uh, go on every space, we just created one uh, narrow uh, lane for vehicles and the rest of the plaza was just for pedestrians. Here another photo. We can see the change that is uh, 
a dramatic change. Another one, uh, where this is the place where we created the, the, the car lane. Another picture from before and after. So uh, the intervention, uh, sorry. So we had an, imme an imme immediate positive response from the, from the residents. And also the data showed, I will show you in a minute. And that helped the intervention to last for more than 15 days. So uh, here you can see the data before the intervention, 60% said that their perception on the road safety was very bad. And later, less than 5% said that, while 50% evaluated as very good. Also, uh, evaluation with uh, just retailers uh, of the area was made and 60%, 64% said they think that the, the intervention could help their business and 71% wanted to be permanent. So uh, with all this feedback, the city decided to implement definitely the project. And it started in May last year. They started a bidding process to start the roadworks with the objective to be, con to be concluded after six months. And now the roadworks are almost concluded. The entire area is almost requalified and there is a new and improved public lighting. The Cidade da Gente project became a government policy and another one at Dragão do Mar was made last year. And there is another one, Cidade da Gente, for this year. Uh, and other interventions based on the tactical urbanism in the city also took place. They started to use this in other projects. So here you can see uh, the, the recent photos from Cidade, the, for, for the definitive transformation of Cidade 2000 that suffered. This is an aerial photo. This is the, the, from the plaza number one, where we created that, just the traffic lane and one traffic lane. And here is from the plaza number two. You, you can see that also the pavement was changed for a more uh, a pavement that helped vehicles to don't to not develop such high speeds. Uh, so main considerations we had, uh, we can say is that uh, the intervention allowed the project to be tested and adjusted. The material, also the, mater the material for the paint he used was the acrylic one, really helped the intervention to last for the 15 days without great maintenance. And as a lesson, be prepared for unforeseen situations, like last minute demands, incorrect measurements, and changes on site. The metrics were fundamental uh, for the success, also for the success of the intervention and to, became, and to become a definitive project for the city. Uh, so this was the case for Fortaleza. Uh, let's move on for the Sao Paulo. Uh, this is the final result for the intervention in Santana. We can see the colorful area at the intersection. Uh, and now I will explore the process uh, uh, that happened on, during, this in, during this intervention. Here we can see the location of the area of, of Santana in an area located at the north of the city center. Uh, this is a photo of how the intersection used to be. We can see that it was a very uh, uh, large intersection. The vehicles had a lot of space to, to, uh, to turn and to pass by. Pedestrians didn't have a lot of spaces. Was not, they didn't have a lot of, they didn't have uh, signals in every, in, on all the, 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 junction, the junctions arms. So uh, the intervention took place in September of 2017. It contemplated two intersections and was led uh, was led by ITDP Brazil with support of these following partners. Santana was chosen because it already had an, an project for a low speed zone there, and CT, the that is the traffic company from Sao Paulo, wanted to execute some roadworks and signage at the area. Also, WRI Brazil promoted in 2016 a public competition for safe designs of a low speed zone called Area 40 by Sao Paulo. Road safety audits were carried. An uh, organization called Cidade, da Viva perform, Cidade Viva performed a diagnosis of the area, counting metrics, pedestrian counts, land use types, and also NACTO and WRI developed a guide of safe design for low speed zones to be used by Sao Paulo. So we had a lot of material for this area. Uh, 
The initial ob objective was to have one month of temporary intervention at black spots of Santana, low speed zone, and to test different designs proposals. The initial challenges were uh, to involve CT uh, since the beginning of the project and engage them on, on this because they were really re reluctant about this. But when the conversation started, CT declined uh, from the one month proposal and accepted it just three days. And even got it worse. During the eve of the intervention, CT, CT changed their minds and authorized just one day of intervention. And they decided this should have uh, like event, event uh, characteristics. Uh, anyway, the CT was involved since the beginning and, and particip participated from all rounds of designs together with the partners so everyone could be aligned uh, on the day of the intervention. This is a sketch of the area with the two intersections that was uh, the, the intervention took place. Uh, this is the, the proposal of design after the, after the interventions. We wanted to create a roundabout on these intersections, that is the first one, uh, also curb extensions and to create a smaller turn rating. Uh, this way we could make vehicles develop its lower speeds and slower turning speed. Also, the curb extensions and a bigger center median could provide more space for pedestrians to wait safely do it a high number of, of pedestrians on this commercial and dance area, and to create shorter crossing distance, guaranteeing a safer crossing. For every meter, uh, this is, came from studies, for every meter reduced on a pedestrian crossing, it, it is expected to decrease pedestrian crashes uh, by up to 6%. six percent. Uh, this is the second intersection. We also created uh, curb extensions and a, and a bigger center median, median, but we also wanted to provide a more organized intersection on this place. The center median extensions forced the right lane on these streets to convert right over here. Uh, and the way we are minimizing vehicle, uh, and that way we are minimizing vehicles conflicts with other lanes. Uh, pedestrian crossings were also provided, supplying the line of desire for, uh, for them. Uh, and here I, I'll also go by a step-by-step -step photos of how the, was the intervention. It also started during the night with the support from city. They helped managing the traffic, they closed some streets and were supervising the, the design execution agreed on the project. It's important to say that the presence of the partners were really important to guarantee that the project would be implemented as everyone agreed first. Because during the execution, some agents uh, from the traffic company were not completely okay with the measures. They were uh, doubting about the, the design that were, that were being performed. So about the materials, uh, different from Cidade 2000, we used uh, chalk uh, mixed with water and pigment to, to paint the new design. Uh, this kind of paint is more temporary and can be washed up if uh, it rains or something. Uh, we also used uh, paint brushes and brooms to assist painting and adhesive tapes to create uh, the correct artistic design that we have on the roundabout. Small plants were placed on the edge of the curb extensions and on the center of the roundabout. Uh, urban furniture helped to create a more livable uh, environment. And uh, close to these curb extensions where people were sitting and hanging out, uh, were placed, by, were placed uh, boards to listen to some question for the community. Here on this, on this photo, on the left board, we have a heat map from the area, from the road crashes. And on the right one, on the right board, uh, the board was asking people uh, how they felt, uh, where they felt less or more safe uh, from a road safety perspective. Also, another board were, were placed asking people to show uh, through a, a string the way they did to get out or to get to the train station from Santana uh, area. Uh, and on the right of this board uh, 
what were the factors that made people feel unsafe walking around Santana? So now some pictures from before and after. This is the first intersection. Uh, we can see the change and how we really changed it. It narrowed a lot the, the intersections. Pedestrian had a lot of more space and it had a really shorter uh, crossing distance. Uh, this is the second intersection. Uh, it became way more organized and safer for pedestrians. So here we have the results from the evaluation made with the residents. Uh, this was, was supported by partners and by a, an architectural school from the region. Uh, I just wanted to highlight uh, some of this data. Uh, for example, the 40% yelled for pedestrians, uh, for pedestrians by drivers, uh, the increase of 40%, right? And the reduction on turning speed from buses, which is critical from a road safety perspective. Uh, so this is the total budget uh, spent. Uh, we had a $3,000 more or less for the execution and the materials and transportation and a 1,000 for the community, $1,000 more or less uh, for the community engagement material. The metrics uh, costed nothing because we're performed by the volunteers from uh, the architectural school. And uh, the definitive implementation, uh, it took place nine months later uh, and CT did it all by itself and did not involve the partners. Uh, although we say definitive, uh, most of the materials used are not definitive and uh, they will need constant, constant maintenance, I'll show you. So this is the before, this is the temporary, and this is the definitive implementation that CT uh, made. We can see here a GIF from the, uh, how we changed the intersection, the, the dynamic from the before until the definitive implementation. Right, and uh, so to wrap up, uh, we can see on this scheme uh, that I presented on the beginning of the presentation, uh, who can promote tactical urbanism uh, of these two interventions took place. We can see that Santana are a more not institutionalized uh, intervention because ITDP uh, made the, ide the idealization of this intervention, uh, while Cidade 2000 is like a full institutionalized intervention. Uh, we can see that both work and how we change the areas for a more people-centered areas and a more safe areas for everyone. So that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Bruno. That was fantastic. Thank you, Rohit, also. That was really great. Um, Bruno, I'm going to ask you the similar question that I asked Rohit, um, which is, in the case of Sijaje Dosnil, um, what happened to the social infrastructure that was there, the temporary benches and the sun umbrellas and the plant jars? Uh, the temporary materials that were used there, uh, they, they suffer a, a different uh, uh, process from Santana. From Santana, they took all the materials they bought, from, the partners bought that materials, and so they just donated after the intervention. On Cidade 2000 was a little bit different because the materials was mostly uh, funded by secretariats or by, the, the, by uh, other partners, and they just gone back to, to the secretariats. But it's important to say that during the 30 days that the intervention was there, and actually it took a, uh, they took a, a longer time to, to start the, the definitive implementation, all the jars and the benches, they stayed there. And, uh, was, and it's uh, great to see that the, the residents didn't uh, destroy the, uh, the, the materials or some people that uh, sometimes steal stuff. And uh, because the, the residents enjoyed it so much, the, the area, they, everyone was uh, taking care of that uh, and looking around and the materials just stayed there for longer than was expected but later they return it for the, the secretariats. 
Okay, great. Thank you. Um, okay, so now we're turning to the question and answer section of the presentation. Um, we have a couple of questions posted. Um, thank you for responding, Rohit. I'm still going to pose the questions so others um, can hear sort of more of a, a detailed response. Um, so the first, the first question says, excellent work, Rohit. Did you do swept path analysis before implementing the proposed design? Um, yes, we did swept path, ana swept path analysis uh, before the short-term measures were implemented on site. Um, and that's how we got our intersection design approved with the new geometry before implementation. Okay, great. Um, and then Giselle asks, um, thank you for the presentation, Bruno. Um, what did you... Why did you change the design guidelines from the temporary solution to the definitive solution at Santana Project? Um, it's much more attractive, um, the pedestrian version. Uh, yeah, uh, when the, the, there happened the change from the temporary for the definitive, the company, the traffic company, they did by all, her, all by, all, all by uh, themselves. They didn't involve the partners anymore. And uh, I think they, they just did what they, they were expecting. They wanted some changes. Uh, maybe it's some lack of, uh, sometimes it's hard for the cities to be more bold on these definitive implementations. So they change it a little bit, but uh, and, uh, sometimes using all this colorful stuff, it uh, go against some uh, uh, laws and regular, you have some regular colors or regular materials to be used. And you can't uh, just sometimes use all this uh, these different materials, uh, you know. So they 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 I think they have to be strict stricted for what the law says or for the uh, uh, standard materials they have. Okay. The next question is for. Mr. Tak, um, would it make sense to put also marks on the ground for cars to provide security for the drivers in the Mumbai example? Uh, yes, totally. Um, we need to have um, by um, the car vehicle lanes and turning arrows to be marked on the streets uh, so that vehicle users can follow the lane discipline. Um, in the case of Mumbai, that is still being done. The project is still ongoing. Okay. And then the question was um, for you, Rohit, but you can definitely also respond, Bruno, second. Um, how was the parking problem solved? There were cars parked before and taxis um, in one of the images that you showed, Rohit, and then also in the Sujaj Dos Mill, there was also um, some parking issues there. So can you start, Rohit, and then Bruno, maybe if you want to add on? Yeah. Sure. Um, so in Bruno's presentation, he mentioned that um, we need a pattern change. We need to develop cities with uh, people-oriented mindset more than uh, for car-oriented mindset. Uh, and um, the image which you saw of Nagpara intersection in my presentation, um, that those are the parked taxis. Um, they are the taxi cab parked during the daytime um, or throughout the day. Uh, when the taxi um, drivers are uh, taking break or something like that. You, it's actually an open parking lot only for the park taxis, and they could be parked anywhere else on the street and um, at the space, um, at the intersection, uh, at that huge uh, space which they are covering. So reclaiming space from parking lot was uh, the thing done in that case. And um, when we did the trial, it lasted for 30 days, and... Uh, during that period, the taxi users did find another place to park their taxis. It means like cars can find space along the streets or corridors, and they do not need like such huge space at the intersection. Uh, for for Cidade dois mil, uh, there wasn't one situation that was. I mean, always the parking space is a struggle for us, right? So. Uh, and Cidade 2000 was also a really uh, great struggle we had for for talking with the residents and stuff. But uh, one thing was in favor was that uh, the street market that happened weekly, uh, every time it happened, 
it all also removed the space for parkings for cars to park right so sometimes the vehicles was were, were already used to that people had to park on other spaces because the street market was already there uh, but the the important thing that we have to take from here that it, uh, related also for parking is that uh, the importance of this tactical urbanism uh, tool we have because it's exactly the thing that uh, we can do this temporary and we can explain for people that okay this is just, we're gonna just remove the parking for five or ten or fifteen days then we this will come back uh, and people say ah people are a little annoyed with that but they say okay eventually right because it's a short time and they will have their parking back uh, but then uh, there's the intervention came the inter and, and it took place and people start to enjoy it and then the people that I was parking they are uh, uh, they are in less number than the other ones most of the residents wants that and then you have on your side uh, the the community support for removing that also. So that's the, the, the value of this tool we have called the tactical urbans. Yeah, that's a really great point. Um, this is, yeah, exactly the value of, of tactical urbanism issues is, is that you can build momentum by these very easy interventions. Um, so we have a couple of questions for you, Bruno, about sort of, um, the way that you did the data or the way that the project collected data, how many architecture students needed, how much time did it take, and then were there other sort of community engagement activities um, that were part of this process to get more feedback? Uh, for the Centennial area, the, they had a, like a, a, a professor from a university uh, heard about the, the intervention from uh, a local uh, a regional leader that, that was also engaged on the process. So he offered himself and his class uh, to, to make the, to support the, the intervention and they helped uh, creating the, to help it to, to create this, this questionnaires and they volunteered to participate on the, on the execution and also on the evaluation uh, questionnaire, right? So, I'm not sure about the number of uh, volunteers that uh, they had at the time, but uh, uh, yeah, I, I'm not gonna say a, a random number, but it was not that much. You know, it was a, a small class of, of one, uh, one uh, from a class from the university. So, so and, and they paid, and the cost was nothing for these students because they volunteered for that. Okay, <clears throat> and then we have a question, an interesting question about um, in, in this person's urban planning studies, they have a lecture where, with a professor that showed a picture of a 3D zebra crossing, which um, led to reduced speeds of cars, drastic reduced speeds of cars. Uh, could this be an option for any of the projects you discussed? Are you guys aware of the 3D zebra crossing? Um, uh, sorry, if you were not taking this. Yeah. Um, so in this case, like the 3D uh, zebra crossing, I mean, first time commuter, it does help in reducing the speed. But if the commuter is a daily commuter, in that sense, like he's already aware that it's just a paint, like it is just a, a, a what do you call it? a 3D uh, graphic. Yeah. A graphic which has been created and it's not actually a 3D which is there. So the second time when he's crossing, he's not going to reduce his speed. And in fact, it can also be a little risky because if there is actually a 3D object on the street, he might consider like these are the tactics which are used to reduce the speed. So in little long term, uh, in the little long run, it may actually be a little risky. Uh, what I heard about uh, the 3D uh, crossings, uh, some discussions we had here in Brazil, uh, we didn't use on these interventions, but uh, is that a, this is, uh, the pedestrian crossing is a, an engineering tool, 
right? And uh, they have these standards to be used. And so it's really hard for some cities to use that because of this, uh, these barriers from the, the, from the law, right? And as an engineering tool, it's a, it's a little hard to, to want to change this on uh, these random ways with 3D uh, and arti artistic ways. Uh, but it's, uh, but uh, what Rohit just said, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, important to, to know how that actually works on the long run, right? Okay, and the next question is for you, Bruno. In the case of Cidade dos Mil, the activities made a clear impact. The market brought people to the streets, but for the other two cases in intersections, it was hard to implement some of the program programming. How did you manage or solve this activation or program issue? Uh, uh, sorry, can you repeat the question, please? Sure. Uh, so, in the case of Sijaje Dos Mil, the activities made a clear impact. People were brought to the street, the market brought people to the streets, um, but they're asking in the other two cases where it's intersections, um, was it difficult to implement the program, and if so, how did you manage to solve this activation or program issue? Uh, the one from Santana, right? The two intersections from Santana? Yeah. Okay. Uh, that, uh, since it was just a one-day intervention, uh, it didn't took uh, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, a hard time to, to, to convince people to, the, the, the companies to, to do that. But uh, during the intervention, since there was really colorful stuff and uh, you had other uh, engagement activities, and uh, you had those, uh, the chair, the, the, the beach chairs and the umbrellas, people started getting around. And also the Santana region, it's a really commercial area. So you already had a lot of pedestrians walking around. You had a lot of activity, uh, the commercial activity going on uh, there. So it just improved the, 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 the place, basically. I don't know if that was the question. I think so. Jesus, if you have a follow-up question, please feel free to type it in. Okay. Um, Rohit, I have a question for you. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the challenges faced during implementation of, of the project? Um, sure. Um, I'll go back to the slide for that. Um, okay, sure. Just make sure to take the presentation. Sure. Yeah. So the implementation challenge was um, mainly about um, the contractors involved because when the project got approved and the final implementation started, um, there were like multiple con contractors involved in this um, project. So if you see in this image, um, half of the sidewalk was done by a different contractor and half of, half of the sidewalk was done by a different contractor. They didn't even match the same line of the curb um, and we had to like go and rectify it on site um, and ma made them, uh, we made them match the curbs so that the smooth turning is achieved. So dealing with different uh, contractors um, whose scope of work is, um, it varies. Um, it was kind of a challenge when the implementation was happening. Um, although drawings were provided and um, uh, the design was explained, um, still it, it is a challenge to get some, some, something like this implemented um, on site. Do you want to add something? Yeah, uh, I just want to add to that. Along with uh, this, so the, the design um, looks at certain kind of details which are not really uh, regular details, at least in a city like Mumbai. So explaining that was a bit of a challenge. Plus, uh, the MCGM, which is the Municipal Corporation of Mumbai, itself uh, in itself has multiple uh, uh, it has multiple teams which are working on different things. So, like one is working on landscape, one is working on the street, one is working on the medians, one is working on traffic islands. So, just coordinating bit with all this was a bit uh, of a challenge. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> well, we are approaching the end of the webinar. Um, we don't have any more questions from the audience, but you can absolutely um, 
email um, me or my colleague if you have additional questions. Um, I want to thank you all for joining us today. If you're interested in the series, you can find it at www.thecityfixlearn.org and also on www.thegpsc.org under news and blogs. Please stay tuned for our next webinar in this series on urban GHG emissions, the evolution of accounting frameworks, which will take place on March 29th, and then another one, coming one, delivering local resilience on April 4th. Um, before you go, after you exit the webinar, you will receive an email with a link to complete a short survey. Please take a moment to fill it out. We want your feedback and suggestions on how we continually improve the webinar. And again, if you have questions, you can email myself or Valeria. And on behalf of the resource team, I'd like to thank our speakers today, Rohit and Bruno, for a fantastic job. I'd like to thank Nandini Chandrasekharan and Valeria Hurtado for their support in conceptualizing and coordinating this webinar, and um, to the Jeff and the World Bank for making this series possible. See you next time. Thanks. Thank you very much. I was really glad. Thanks, Tara. Pleasure to participate. Thank you. Yeah, I second Bruno. Thank you.